Hi, this is Leslie Terebesi and this is the third video in our series of six videos on the question of how Islam became political. Before we proceed uh, with the third stage, let us briefly recap what were the results of the first uh, two uh, videos. In the first lecture, you will recall, we have zeroed in on the uh, so-called uh, subordination of uh, reason to tradition, or as we have also called called it the uh, repression of reason. The repression of reason uh, necessitated in turn the elevation of uh, tradition to uh, revelation in order to facilitate the uh, explanation of the allegedly ambiguous and contradictory verses found in the Quran by recourse to tradition. So now in this uh, third video we are going to focus on uh, the third stage in this process in which tradition was elevated a step further uh, to the position of a judge or interpreter of revelation or the Quran. Now this <coughs> elevation of uh, tradition above revelation is uh, expressed in uh, commonly in two uh, sayings which are popular among exegetes and the jurists and the first of these saying is uh, uh, that uh, in Arabic, as Sunnah Kadia Allah Quran. In English, that means the Sunnah judges the Quran. The second popular saying which expresses this uh, relationship between tradition and revelation, uh, the relationship in which tradition is used to explain the Quran, is summed up in uh, the saying according to which uh, the uh, Quran needs the Sunnah more than the Sunnah needs the Quran. So now, with these two uh, uh, perceptions, the exegetes proceeded to explain the allegedly uh, unclear or ambiguous verses of the Quran by reference to tradition. Of course, one problem with this approach was that, in fact, uh, there are only about 15 only about 15% of the Quran lends itself to explanation by recourse to tradition. The remaining 85% of the Quran does not have actually any uh, traditions to explain it. So that's one problem. Another problem with this approach is that what we are doing effectively when we are seeking to explain, uh, you know, revelation by tradition, is that we are ignoring the role of reason and sidelining reason in the conviction that uh, recourse to tradition can explain uh, revelation better than reason. This is somewhat uh, uh, of an odd development because even in the process uh, of the authentication of tradition it was necessary to rely on reason in fact to determine which of the traditions were authentic and which were fabricated and also the use of reason was required in the classification of uh, all the traditions into the various other subgroups that we have such as uh, the tradition that is classified as a good or Hassan tradition, a tradition that is classified as a Ahad tradition or a tradition with a solitary chain of narration or a tradition that is classified as Mutawatir or a tradition that has multiple chains of narrations and so on and so forth. So it is somewhat um, uh, uh, ironic that uh, reason was rejected uh, in favor of tradition while reason was utilized in the first place to authenticate the traditions. There seems to be uh, 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 some sort of an inconsistency here but however that may be there are some additional problems with uh, uh, using traditions to explain plain revelation. First of all, uh, Revelation itself says that it is the best explanation, Ahsan al Tafsir, uh, as it is uh, put in the Quran. So, why would uh, this best uh, interpretation require uh, additional interpretation? Well, <coughs> we have seen that this. Uh, need for uh, additional interpretation arose out of the marginalization of reason as the result of which exegetes uh, began to encounter uh, uh, verses in the Quran that struck them as we have noted earlier as ambiguous and even contradictory. But the problem uh, is still there in so far as when we interpret a revelation uh, in light of tradition w what we are in fact doing is trying to 
uh, throw light on uh, a narrative that presents itself as the enlightening book, as the light, and we are trying to enlighten uh, this uh, enlighten this particular text or narrative using other narratives, uh, basically narratives of human origin, uh, man-made hadiths uh, and reports uh, uh, from uh, basically ordinary human beings. So what we are basically saying here is that uh, essentially that uh, human beings can actually explain better than God. Now, is that a plausible assumption to make? Moreover, we know that uh, the Quran presents itself as a clear book, Haza Kitabul Mumin, and a clarifying book, one that is moreover easy to understand and remember, as mentioned in Surah 54, verses 17, 22, and three, two other verses. So, uh, the Quran, in other words, presents itself as a clear book, uh, so we may well wonder how or why would a clear book be in need of any additional clarification, especially uh, if its words were actually the words of God, and I don't think there is any human being that would claim, uh, any human being in his right mind that would claim that he or she can explain better than God himself. So this is another problem with the uh, with the uh, use of tradition to explain a revelation. <coughs> One other problem that this approach is exposed to is that it actually reverses the relationship between re, uh, revelation and tradition. I, actually, in traditional jurisprudence, uh, uh, the Quran or revelation occupies the uppermost place and is followed by tradition in a second place. Uh, in a third place, we find uh, the consensus of the ulama, and in a fourth place, we find uh, ijtihad or the use of independent reasoning to uh, arrive at uh, rulings uh, of the Sharia. So, but what we are witnessing here uh, in uh, exegesis is a reversal between the top two, uh, you know, uh, sources of the Sharia or roots of the Sharia, and we are witnessing uh, tradition being now placed above revelation. Now, is that not problematic, actually, from uh, the Quranic uh, point of view or the, from the point of view of monotheism, for that matter? How can we possibly maintain that uh, there is uh, some authority that is even higher than the Quran, which can explain uh, the revelation of the Quran better than uh, God himself uh, explained it? It doesn't seem to make too much sense. It seems to imply that God somehow, who is considered to be above all needs, actually is in need of some of his own servants to help him make himself clear in the Quran in those particular passages where he allegedly did not uh, make himself sufficiently clear. Now this, uh, this uh, perception uh, practically borders on the blasphemous. So we need to ask once again, uh, can we really accept the perception that uh, human uh, narrators are able to explain uh, revelation or the Quran better than God himself? One of the problems to remember with using the traditions to explain revelation is that the traditions, uh, in fact, are the words of the narrators, they are not the exact verbatim words of the prophet. They are paraphrases uh, of narrators uh, and they indicate what these narrators thought that the prophet had said. Now, uh, another problem with uh, the uh, use of the tradition to explain the revelation is that there is evidence in the very traditions themselves uh, that the prophet himself in fact prohibited the uh, writing down of his uh, traditions because he feared that they could be confused with the Quran. Now this prohibition by the way is also reiterated uh, or made first in the Quran in fact in uh, Surah uh, number 69 al haqqa in verses 44 to 46 where God basically uh, prohibits the Prophet from adding anything to the Quran in the name of God. 
and in fact uh, the prophet is threatened with uh, punishment if he were to do it. Of course we know that the prophet didn't do it. It was some of the people that came after him that decided to collect the, the traditions and present them as a kind of second uh, revelation uh, or second source of uh, even of uh, Islamic law and something to be consulted when we are attempting to understand the Quran. So as we can see there are many problems to which this methodology of interpretation of the Quran is exposed to. So perhaps uh, we can uh, sum it up by observing that what we need to do it seems to me is to review this methodology of uh, you know interpreting the Quran and perhaps consider an alternative methodology which has been uh, described as a method whereby the Quran is used to explain the Quran. Tafsir uh, al-Quran bil Quran as it is put in Arabic and this was in fact a method that was recommended uh, among others by Muhammad Abdu, uh, the uh, reformer in Egypt uh, who attempted to uh, kind of uh, uh, bring about a, a revival or renewal of rationalism in Islamic studies. Another problem with the methodology of using traditions to explain uh, revelation, the revelation of the Quran, that in some cases uh, the alleged explanation of the Quran actually went uh, beyond mere explanation. Uh, we know very well that in fact uh, there were uh, ulama uh, from very early on who actually believed that even a solitary hadith or a solitary tradition had the power to abrogate a Quranic verse. This is confirmed uh, among others by Taha Jabir Alwani in his book published by IIIT in 2017 and the book is called Reviving the Balance. Now we should also note that this opinion or this perception that a solitary tradition could abrogate a Quranic verse was not a minority opinion. This was a majority opinion. So this is also a huge concern that uh, the uh, perception or the uh, practice of abrogating Quranic verses with uh, uh, prophetic traditions because this type of abrogation amounts essentially to the abrogation of the word of God by the words of human beings. A related and in fact a more serious problem here is the uh, problem of replacing revealed rulings in the revelation by rulings derived from tradition. And I will just give one example here. The well-known example of the punishment for, a pos uh, for uh, adultery. The Quran specifies a uh, hundred lashes uh, for the convicted adulterers based on the testimony of four reliable witnesses. However, uh, the tradition uh, on adultery or traditions, I believe there are altogether six of such traditions, they basically allege that this uh, ruling was abrogated and in fact replaced by a prophetic ruling which uh, actually demanded the uh, stoning to death as the uh, proper punishment for adultery upon conviction based on four reliable witnesses or uh, even based on con uh, a conviction based on confession. So here we see some of the uh, problematic consequences of using traditions to explain uh, revelation. As we can see uh, the use of tradition went actually beyond mere explanation and it even uh, uh, came to the point where tradition was used not just to explain the revelation but even to abrogate the revelation and, in e and even to replace uh, revealed verses in some cases by uh, rulings drawn from traditions. But these uh, further developments we will uh, explore further in the uh, fourth and fifth uh, segments of this video series that we are preparing on the question of how Islam became political. Thank you very much.